Welcome to Arts and Ideas, Arts 304. Today we're going to consider aspects that impact analyzing our past. This is an important part of determining the value of art and how art relates to us culturally, socially, politically, and personally. Throughout this course we're going to be considering the ideas and the artifacts from the notion of a person an object and a story. The person is self-explanatory. With every single idea or artifact, there is a person connected with that. An artisan, an artist, a political leader, a common person, you name it. The person is always there. The object itself, the idea or the artifact, is self-explanatory as well. And there are many ways we can view these to determine its value and its place in society. Where we want to go with all this is what's the story? What's the story behind all of this? Why did this object exist? Why is it significant to us today? What lessons can we learn from it? In analyzing our past, there are four important things that we're going to talk about right now. One is the nature of artifacts. We're going to talk about meeting people. We're going to explore objects, and we are going to, as an archaeologist, unearth stories that have perhaps been buried for long, long times, but stories that are vivid and lively and can communicate to us today and can help us give us perspective in our contemporary world. First, the nature of artifacts. There is always a context. Sometimes artifacts are incomplete or broken, but there is a contextual relationship of the artifact to the idea or the situation. We're going to look at uh, a couple of paintings. They go by the same title, actually, The Key of Dreams, La Clé de Son, by René Magritte, who was a Belgian artist born in 1898 and died in 1967. As we're going to look at these paintings, we should be thinking in our mind, what's the label that we can apply to this painting? What is this painting communicating? How does Magritte use the gap between words and images effectively? And how do we know all of this for certain? And again, sometimes artifacts are complete, sometimes they are broken or incomplete. But let's take a look at these paintings. And again, we have two images, one created in 1930 and one created five years later in 1935. Take a look at the painting on the left. We have a picture of an egg, a woman's shoe, a man's bowler hat, a flaming candle, a glass, and a hammer. On the right we have different imagery. We have a horse, a clock, a small vase or pitcher of some type, and a valise, a small uh, suitcase. What do you notice about these two paintings? For one thing, the labels or identifications of the objects in the paintings on the left are in French. The ones on the right are in English. Let's take a look at the 1935 one, for example, the ones that are in English. We have a picture of a horse, the head of a horse, but yet it says the door. We have a clock, it says the wind. We have a picture, and it says the bird. The only one that's truly labeled in the same way that we would label it not in a dream would be the valise, the small suitcase. Take a look at the picture on the left. We have an egg, a woman's shoe, a man's bowler hat, the candle, the glass, and the hammer. We have, let's take a look at the man's bowler hat first. First, We have la neige. In French that means the snow. The snow with a hat. Well, there is a connection there because a man may wear a hat when he goes out into the snow. Take a look at the woman's shoe, La Lune. Now that is a dress shoe, granted, and it's the kind of shoe that might be worn to a formal evening event. So La Lune, the moon, that, there's a connection there. But it's not a label. It's not a direct connection. The glass on the lower left-hand side, L'Orange, that is not a glass. 
Le Désert, the hammer. Well, again, the desert, if you think about the poetic and philosophical aspects of the desert being like the sun's anvil, then yes, I can see that connection between the hammer. But again, these labels that Magritte has placed on all these images are layers apart from what we would typically label. It really talks more about its context, its location, and some type of insightful relationship um, between the object and the label. Let's meet a few interesting people. Let's look at a painting by Hans Holbein. It's called The Ambassadors. It was created in 1533. And here we have two gentlemen, uh, younger career gentlemen. And the question is, what do we know about these people, their lives, and their times from this painting? We do have an exact date for this painting, but even without that exact date, it would be capable, we would be capable of making a guess or discernment based on their clothing. We have one man on the left. He appears to be a leader of some type. He has a lot of very fine clothing that he's wearing, furs. He's wearing a medallion crest. He has in his hand um, some type of special object. Perhaps it's a seal. Uh, perhaps it's some type of symbol of royalty. We don't know. He's not wearing a crown. He's wearing a simple a cap. So I would say he's probably not the king, but he is someplace in royalty, and he has a um, particular um, station in life. The man on the right has a very interesting look to him. Um, his beard and, and grooming is similar to the man on the left, but he's wearing a cleric's hat. He's wearing a hat that a, someone who's a student of theology would tend to wear. He's also wearing long robes. Again, he could be a scholar or he could be a priest of some type. But he appears to be, based on his hat, I would say, he appears, appears to be uh, en route to his goal. He's uh, undertaking education in some respect. Now they're both leaning on a cabinet, and there are a lot of objects on this cabinet. On the upper level, we have a globe, and we have several small objects that appear to be objects that were used for navigation and exploration. On the lower shelf, we have, again, a small globe or map. We also have a lute, and we have a small music book as well. Now there's a very strange object. If you look on the floor in the center, we can't quite make it out and tell exactly what it is. But it's something that's very distorted. It's almost like, again, like a dream or like an apparition of some type, maybe a ghost. Uh, but again, it's appearing in this formal portrait. There must have been a reason for Hans Holbein to put that very strange looking image in the middle of this particular painting. Later on this semester, we will consider these two gentlemen again and we'll consider this painting at length. But again, um, even though we don't know a lot, there is a lot if we, could, we can learn from these two gentlemen and their world by looking at the objects in the painting. Exploring objects. Here's an interesting page. What is this page? Well, it's a page out of a notebook of some type. You may recognize it or you may have seen pages like this before. It's rather, by a rather famous Renaissance artist. What's being presented? Well, it's skeletons. It appears to be appendages. It's, it's arms. It's bones. It's things that are observed. It is the documentation of an exploration. Why is it important? Well, I do not read the language that is on this particular page, but there appears to be a great amount of detail. The other thing is kind of interesting. If you look very, very carefully, you'll see that the text is flush uh, justified on the right side and not on the left side. Um, there is something about this particular page that uh, I'll tell you about in just a moment. And it's something that's very unusual. So why is this important? This is a very old drawing and it's very detailed and it's, was created by someone undergoing a very intense and detailed exploration of some type. For what purpose we don't know just by looking at the page. But when I tell you who created this page, then you'll say, ah, I understand now. This is a page from one of Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks. He was a great student of nature. He observed numerous things. 
but he kept these voluminous notebooks on his um, scholarship. He was concerned with human anatomy, he was concerned with nature, he was concerned with fantasy and fiction, and he created these wonderful notebooks. Now, the reason why it is uh, the text is justified on the right and not on the left is because he actually wrote these pages backwards. So this way, in order to read the page, you have to hold it up to a mirror. Now, why in the world would someone do that? Well, it's because in his day and time, this kind of detailed exploration might be considered to go against um, theology or go against the church in some respect. And he did not, of all things, he did not want to be brought up on charges of heresy against the church, for which he could have been excommunicated or he could have been executed, depending on the particular state of Italy he was living in at the moment. So, um, again... Sometimes we would say, oh, he was just being neurotic. But um, Italy of da Vinci's time was a very unstable political place, and people would be executed or vanish for reasons far less than heresy against the church. We're going to unearth some stories as well. Here is an image from a movie that we're going to be watching later in the term, and it is an image, a scene from Othello, the play, The Moor of Venice. Othello is on the left and Iago is on the right. So who was Othello and what's his story? Well, he is um, a Moor. He is not from European descent. He is uh, from African descent. And uh, the story of Othello includes the relationships between these two men and other people, includes aspects of insanity, includes racial hatred and bigotry. That's one thing that's so fascinating about Shakespeare is he would not withhold anything of human experience in his writing. He documented emotions, life, the times, and he did it very poetically and very theatrically to the extent that we perform many of his plays today and we read his sonnets. And we are inspired by them today in the, in the same way that the audiences were inspired at his time. Um, to unearth the story, we could look at these pictures we could consider the details of these two men. We could look at the very pensive and solemn view that Othello has as he's looking out towards us. And we could have Iago looking at Othello a little bit puzzled, a little pondering, trying to question what was going on. We'll learn more about their stories later.